It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I invite the top talent in the world of writing to join me around a digital coffee table and chat about the methods, tips and tricks that are working in the business right now. Today's date is the 18th? Wow, no, I'm one day ahead. It's the 17th of October and we are in the rundown to Halloween, which is a very exciting time for me. Um, Busy, busy, busy at the minute. Just finished writing a book. I have lots of editing to do and... Yeah, October seems to have thrown a lot my way, but by the end of this month, um, I'll have quite a few different products out and lots of things to give to my readers, which is very exciting. Um, Before we go into the information about today's guest and everything that was contained in this interview, I did just want to do a quick mention that we did have a couple of sound issues while recording this episode. Uh, I've pieced it together. I've fixed it as well as I can. I've put down all the silicon gel to seal all the air cracks, but there are a couple, there might be a couple of little... um, nuances of just where the sound has gone a bit funny but we've done our best I think um, overall I'm happy with how it came out the one downside is that at the end of the interview it sounds like I'm just talking to myself where Michael Brent's audio cut out slightly and you miss a corker of a circumcision joke so I can only apologize but that also does set the scene for the type of talk that we had um, around Michael Brent Collings who is my guest writer today now Michael Brent Collings is someone who genre hops a lot. He's very, very successful in the independent community. Um, he has his own company, Written Insomnia Media, uh, Written Insomnia Press, and he, he goes a lot more into that in the interview. But some of the main points of conversation we talk about today are one of them being that Michael Brent recently performed uh, at his first TEDx talk. And in that, he talks a lot about um, his battling with depressive disorder and how to deal with your mental health as a writer as there might be some issues there so there's some really useful takeaways here that could apply to some people um he talks about managing genre hopping and how he works like a badass being a former lawyer and now just taking that into his publishing business and also the many masks that you have to wear when you are an independent publisher so we go into marketing business finance cover design editing coaching the whole the whole works um is covered in this very succinct little interview so um lots going on there but before we jump into the main interview i want to give everyone a reminder that this show is brought to you by patreon.com forward slash great great writers share helps if i could say that right um where for as little as a dollar a month you can support the show and you can get access to a load of extra bonuses um including joining us in our private slack group getting to ask the guests of the show questions and being entered into our monthly giveaway which this month is libby hawker's take off your pants and i'll say no more on that for now and without further ado let's dive into my second horror author of october which is completely coincidental and unplanned um but this fantastic and wide-ranging interview with the wonderful Michael Brent Collings. Enjoy. Michael Brent Collings is an internationally best-selling novelist, produced screenwriter, and multiple Bram Stoker Award finalist. While he is best known for horror and is one of the most successful indie horror authors in the United States, he's also written best-selling thriller, fantasy, science fiction, mystery, humour, young adult, middle grade works, and Western romance. It's a hell of a list. As a novelist, Michael Brent has written dozens of bestsellers that have received critical acclaim, and he and his work have been featured on everything from Mum Mum and Pop podcasts to Publishers Weekly, the San Francisco Book Review, NPR, and he's recently also given his first ever TED Talk at TEDx Rexburg. Michael Brent, welcome to the show. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Man, that is a hell of an intro to read through, and it's just an impressive <laughs> resume to uh, to go through. Um, oh. I've, got, I've got so many questions to to dive in and sort of attack you with. Um, but I guess one of the things I wanted to sort of start with is, as an author who seems to put a lot of his eggs into the the horror and the dark fiction um, basket, what do mm. you do to celebrate Halloween, and, and how are you, and how much are you looking forward to, or or not <laughs> to this month? You know what? It's funny because. Um, 
my favorite hol holiday is actually Christmas. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got two kids at home we were talking before with. I've got one with <laughs> scarlet fever and one with pneumonia, so I've got a little bit of clogging as well. Just hope um, they don't combine into one super virus. I feel like I'm in a freaking remake of Little Women. It's ridiculous. Like we have the old timey viruses at home. Someone's going to get scurvy and rickets, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so my favorite is is actually Christmas. It's funny because when I became better known for horror, like we would just give out candy, and I kind of went. I mean, it's not like anyone's at, at my house filming it, you know, going like famous horror author Michael Brent Collins sucks at Halloween. But, um, <laughs> you know, I kind of felt this like pressure. So now we do kind of a little miniature spook alley. And it's kind of fun because it, it's it is pretty good for about 15 feet. And that's all we were shooting for. And it's hilarious because we have to have two sets of candy, one on the inside and one on the outside for people who just are not going in there. Oh, wow. Is it that spooky? It, you know, it isn't, it isn't terrifying, but we live in like, yeah, there's the scene on, in Halloween, uh, or on Halloween and ET with all the kids going everywhere. And you're like, nah, there's no such thing as that kind of a, you know, neighborhood. Well, I live in it. So it, <laughs> you know, we've got little five and four year olds and they just look at the smoke coming out and they hear the weird sounds. Cause they have, you know, Halloween effects in there and they're like, nope, not going to happen. And I, you know, I will damage adults all day long and twice on Sundays, but I'm not going to do that to little kids so if they're not interested i'm like here's your tootsie roll man <laughs> it's very noble of you I, you know i try and be chivalrous <laughs> to be fair, like, yeah yeah absolutely i uh, i definitely want to get to that place so far the the most i stretch you because i've got a little four-year-old about to turn five and he's uh he's become nuts for halloween he's been asking for halloween for about six <laughs> months which is crazy because he doesn't ask for christmas um, but the most we do at the minute is a, a pumpkin in the windowsill, but I'm planning to expand that and potentially go down that route of trying to create a little tunnel of fear that people have to pass through to, to earn their candy. It does get a bit easier when the kids are older. It's like you don't have to worry as much about the kid actually pulling down the pumpkin and like eating the candle while it's still lit, which is, <laughs> you know, it's a real thing. Like parents, anyone who's not a parent, they're like, how hard is it? Put a candle up, keep the kid away. But they don't understand. They nope. have like a 700 foot arm span and they move like freaking ninjas <laughs> on, amphetam on amphetamines. It's just ridiculous. It's crazy. It's crazy. That's why we specifically bought a digital, a, a little electronic candle <laughs> so that he couldn't, he couldn't burn his face off. That, that there was, you that go. Was fun for him. Yeah, but we uh, we should probably get into talking about writing, as this is the Great Writers uh, Share podcast. Ah, right. um, and as I said in the intro, you've you've worked in a hell of a lot of genres. Do you just want to maybe touch on a little bit about your writing career, where you started, and how you've managed to hit so many of those those goalposts along the way? Sure. Um, so I started in a writing household. So it's not like I had a huge leg up, but I mean, imagine a, you know, a race and I already, a mile long race and I already started a quarter mile along because my father was the um, director of a creative writing program at a, a major university. So I grew up with thousands and thousands of books in the house. And this was when we had actual like proto Kindles. You actually had to open the pages and stuff like that. Um, you know, the swiping was physical page turning. And my dad brought me into his office and said, like, if you can reach it, you can read it. And, and he, he had cleverly, uh, organized shelves by fear factor. And that worked great for like a week until I realized I was big enough to drag the, the ladder in there. Um, <laughs> So I just kind of read everything and, and I grew up writing stories. I didn't, I, I never wanted to make like a career of it. I never thought, Oh, I'm going to be a writer. Um, I tell people the way I became a full-time writer was I failed dismally at not being a full-time writer. You know, um, I wanted to have regular jobs and be a normal guy. And I was a lawyer for a decade and, and, um, and none of those things worked out and I just kind of tripped along. And the only thing I could sort of keep doing was writing no matter what, um, through health issues and I had some pretty major ones, uh, or job loss or whatever it was, I could still write and, and it just sort of grew from there. Um, and I write all these different genres cause I am best known for horror and I kind of do a horror story and then a non horror story and then a horror story and a non horror story. But I've never thought of myself like I'm Michael Brent, the horror writer. I've just thought of myself as just this storyteller who is lucky enough that people will pay for his stories. And that's kind of magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been, um, something that's actually sort of gripped me quite a lot lately is listening to different podcasts, different writers, and just generally looking at, because I'm, I'm not going to go massively into my story at the minute, just because I want the spotlight to be on you, but my personal journey at the minute means that I might potentially be jumping into another uh -huh. genre. And there's a lot of, um, I guess, mindset and mentality that goes behind that because you start to, the, the way that I see it, you either go down the route of 
being a writer who works within a particular genre and you're known as that genre as a writer, or you yeah. can create a brand behind your name, which enables you yeah. to be free and write across all these different things. So how, how have you managed that sort of transition? Cause I, I imagine so, and I'm obviously never, not going to put words in your mouth, but I imagine at some <laughs> point you started in a particular genre. So maybe the horror yeah. picked up quicker than the rest. And then you branch out into the others. How did you sort of manage that transition and make that work? Cause oh, that's quite difficult to do poorly. I manage it poorly. <laughs> um, it, Excellent. It, it is hard. It, I will tell you, here's the best part for me, honestly, is going to, you know, you go to Amazon and it says customers also purchased and it's got like just the randomest assortment of things because depending on what I've just put out, it could be horror, it could be an urban fantasy. Usually it's all of the above. And then if you go to my own Amazon page and you and you sort it by best rated, it is an urban fantasy, a horror, a romance, you know, it's like every single thing. And that's a lot of fun. It is hard um, sort of balancing them as far as not so much as my audience. I've got I've got kind of two audiences. One is the Western romance and that's never been, I mean, no offense. I love Western romance. It's actually, I find the closest genre to horror as far as what it's trying to do and what it accomplishes. Um, But those two audiences are kind of separate because they just seem diametrically opposed to most people. And I get that. So um, those two audiences kind of have a bit of a a, a firewall between them. But other than that, on the non-romance side, I'm very lucky that I can kind of write whatever I want. And I have enough of a core audience that it's typically profitable. Um, That said, every time I step away from horror, it's like I'm taking a little pay cut. So I do have to have a story I really love, you know. Um, Like my next book that's coming out uh, on Halloween actually is called Scavenger Hunt. And that's just a horror thriller. And then after that, I'm releasing a um, middle grade young adult book. And I have to be able to say to my audience, like, I know this isn't scary, but you're really going to like it. So there's a little bit more of a sales pitch that goes into the non-horror at this point. And that's fine. Um, I The hardest thing is keeping Amazon funneling my readers because they do not, you know, their artificial intelligence, their all their um, computing ideas kind of get thrown off when you write everything and that does make it more difficult but you you roll with it so why do you write in so many different genres is it just because you love the idea of the the story overall is it because you just don't want to be restricted to a particular genre uh it's probably a little bit of both i mean i like i said i love stories and and if you go back through my writing i actually just released a, a collection of my stories called darkling smiles and I really, in that, I put out a never-before-published story I wrote when I was 18. And there's a, a real science fiction fantasy feel, but there's also horror in it. So I think because I grew up with this mishmash of writing, um, you know, I told you if I could read it, if I could reach it, I could read it. And then my dad noticed I was reading a lot of trash, basically, which, you know, he had nothing against, but he's like, let's round this out. So I, I, you know, I'd read a Piers Anthony and then I'd read a Dickens and then I'd read a King, which isn't trash, but he wanted, you know, the, the less currently popular stuff. So I'd read a Dumas and I just kind of flip flop back and forth. And that really, um, gave me an appreciation of all these genres and of the fact that any story to be really, really effective should have sort of a touch of all of it. You know, it should have humor. It should have horror. It Mm -hmm. should have some romance, not necessarily the kissy kissy kind, but there should be characters who come to love and appreciate each other so um once you determine that once you decide well i'm going to put a little bit of everything in then you realize what but i have to sell it as something so i kind of look at the overarching picture and whatever that is that's the the quote-unquote genre uh i'll market it as because all genre really is is which bookshelf uh will it be on in barnes and noble or on the amazon store um so that's the big determiner is how to market it less what story am i going to tell i just try and tell a bitchin story <laughs> do you still read as much these days i can imagine with sort of family life and obviously the by by looking through your website and everything that you do you you keep yourself a, a busy man how does your reading look this day these days is it <laughs> dropped off somewhat is it still sort of up there as a priority or um it, it's it, it kind of ebbs and flows what i tell people is my reading uh my reading variety is limited only by the square footage of of my toilet tank tops <laughs> um because and you know this as a father it's like oh i'm gonna go in my little tiny office with a lock and i'll just pretend yep. i'm pooping for like the next hour and a half right <laughs> i'm um, so glad i'm not the only one <laughs> <laughs> right you've been in there a long time i'm sick leave me alone you know um 
And that's life. And and it is, there's definitely days where I get home and I'm like, I have a lot of books that I, I have a to be read pile that's hitting close to a thousand and I'm not exaggerating. Wow. They're all books I'm supposed to read for this, that reason, you know, for market research or because a friend asked me to or whatever it is. And, um, and a lot of them are really cool looking. And I get to the end of the day and I'm like, I've already lived in my imagination all day long. I am super tired. I don't want to create any more word pictures, even when they're helped by someone else. I'm going to go blow crap up and play Fortnite, you know, and that's, Mm -hmm. that's kind of how I detox. Fantastic. Um, one thing that you did mention earlier that I do definitely want to, uh, sort of highlight a bit more and and go into, because I watched your Ted talk that you performed at TEDx Rexburg, Uh um, which I thought was, absolutely inspiring i thought it was really really well delivered um and definitely touched really well on one of the i guess one of the hottest subjects currently circulating the world at the minute which is um mental health and well-being right. what's your relationship with battling with mental health um and how would you sort of sum that up <laughs> well it, it's just that i'm battling it you know on days where i'm not battling it it's more like just kind of a creepy stalker it's always sort of there in the background um And that's the reality of if you have a mental health issue. Um, I have major depressive disorder with suicidal tendencies and and psychotic breaks. And just saying that a lot of people kind of, and I address this in the TEDx talk, a lot of people hear some of those and they're like, whoa, you're creepy and you're going to like, you know, come home and bite me or something. Um, And it's stuff that mostly affects me and those closest to me for better or for worse. So um, my relationship is I get up every day and I try and get out of bed and most days I manage it and some days I just don't. And, and the days I don't, um, you know, everything's black and dark and horrible and, and my poor family's going to put up with misery and the best I can hope for on that day is to kind of go, but tomorrow maybe I'll get out of bed. I think it was really interesting as well. The, so the title was, um, uh, forgive me, I've got the exact title, but it was along the lines of <laughs> making, of villainy being a superhero a superpower yeah and sort of making confessions the, of a supervillain that's it and making making the best of a bad situation was it was how did you approach for a start getting the ted talk and, and how did you pitch that idea to them well um the way i approached i mean there's ted talks all over there and they're tedx they're ted's like the big one in sweden or switzerland or one of those sw places and mm-hmm. um, um <laughs> and then there's tedx talks which are locally run and sort of loosely affiliated with the ted brand um in certain ways and so they had one kind of close-ish and my wife said you should go talk about this stuff because you know you're open about it and you seem to help people when you chat with them Um, and I just went and the way I pitched it was I literally brought a, uh, towel and put it around my neck. And I said, we all want to be superheroes. (laughs) And most of us feel like we fail. And, and from the point of view of a guy who scares people for a living, who, you know, that's my job is to scare you. And that makes me kind of a supervillain. So I'd like to talk about what makes the world full of heroes. No, I think it was, uh, like I say, the the talk was absolutely fantastic. It's, it's, I mean, I personally can't say that I've ever suffered from that kind of mental health. So please, by all means, correct me if I do get any of this wrong, because I do want to represent mental (laughs) health in the most accurate way possible, particularly to listeners who might be in similar situations or um, have sort of gone through depressive episodes while trying to write. And I, I, I just, if you'll allow me just to dig a little bit deeper. Sure. How, as someone who does suffer from depressive disorder, how do you find that, that uplift in order to try and see those um episodes i guess as a a positive and to put that positive spin because you did such a fantastic job delivering all of that as a positive and at the end of the talk you sort of talk about all the minor things that people go through in their day in terms of sort of giving or sharing or just being there for people that positively Mm. impacts other people how how do you twist that mentality to go from that sort of negativity into that positivity because that's that's got to be a tough hurdle to to jump over so uh, the the thing that people have to remember remember first of all is I was giving that talk on a good day, um, and it's really that's the thing that surprises people. And I think one of the things that's difficult for people who have mental health issues is you don't walk out into the street and interact with people typically on your rough days. So someone looks at someone who seems very extroverted and happy and they're like oh well you know they're being a baby or they don't really have this issue it's pretty obvious and you don't see them on the days where they curl up and weep so as far as you know what i did preparation wise is you kind of just get through it and and the secret to 
dealing with this is not stopping breathing. I tell people the secret to immortality is to breathe in every time you breathe out because (laughs) in the movies, it's always like this big, tell my mom, I love her. And I, and it's like someone should just stand there and be like, breathe in. And then they go, oh, I'm back. Well, I'm and, curious. And that, yeah, that's it, man. I'll live forever now. And, and that's kind of what just what you have to do. And it's it's really helpful to have a support system. I'm so grateful for my wife, um, above all, who sits and knows kind of the danger signs. And part of what she has to do is, is say, okay, nothing Michael Brent says about his life or about his situation is going to be valid for the next 12 hours. And I just have to kind of ignore it and that bless her heart. That is so hard to do. And I can't, I can't tell you how much I love and admire and respect her for just being able to ignore me on that level um, Mm. while still staying in the room. Anyone who's got these issues, find somebody who's willing to sit with you in the dark and ignore the stupidity that you say and just kind of be there and and prove that someone's still going to be around on the other side. How is a... how has depression influenced your writing? Does it, does it make that much of appearance or do you sort of, are you able to separate the two? Oh yeah. Well, it, it, it appears very much. Um, you know, as far as what depression is, a lot of it is just seeing the universe through a lens of hopelessness. And that certainly appears in a lot of fiction, not just mine, but everywhere. Good fiction, there should always be that moment of hopelessness. You know, that's the all is lost moment Mm. where the hero's not going to make it, where, um, you know, Holly Gennaro is grabbed by Hans and he's got a gun to her head and John McClane has no bullets left. And you're like, well, this is not going to work out. And then it does. Um, and whether you're talking about action or romance or horror, obviously there's a lot of those moments in a horror novel. So it's very easy for me to project into a bad moment. Um, one of the best compliments I got, uh, was I wrote a book called the dark lights and it's a sci-fi horror. And in the story, the main character, his wife commits adultery. And I had a uh, guy write me this long letter that boiled down to, I'm so sorry this happened to you obviously, because it happened to me and you got so much of it right. And I was like, man, I've, it's never happened to me. My <laughs> wife and I are rock solid. Wow. Like if you showed her a Photoshop of me banging a, another woman, she'd probably <laughs> laugh and be like, that is good Photoshop, you know, because yeah. um, it's just not happening. And But uh, because I can sit there and remember what it's like to look at my wife and go, she's leaving me. She's figuring out in this instant the best way to pack and take the kids. She can't love me, you know, and that's all kind of things that you, that infects your universe if you've mm-hmm. if you've been cheated on. And so I'm able to take sort of those everyday moments and then twist them into something where the the antagonist or the protagonist just doesn't know how he's going to get through it or she's going to get through it. Um, so yeah, my depression's a part of me and my. Mm, my crazy moments, you know, (laughs) they're all, they're all, uh, part of who I am. And so I can either ignore them and cut off a piece of myself in my writing, or I can use it all. So I choose to use it all. And you don't seem to let any of that impact your actual productivity, or at least from, again, what I've, what I found in my research. I mean, you've got a lot going on. You've, you've got your, your own press, you've got written insomnia Mm -hmm. press, um, you're running courses, you're offering advice and different services to writers. You seem to have created an entire business around just being productive and (laughs) and around story which i think is as someone who loves story personally i think is obviously the the dream to to live in how do you how do you manage so much stuff well you know i work so i used to be a lawyer like i I said i used to be a a partner in a los angeles law firm and as far as the hours they work and all that stuff it's all true um Mm. and i work a lot harder as a writer and people hear that and they go so how does the depression and stuff fit in and i tell them how it fits in is I will write or I'll work 40 to 60 and sometimes more than that hours a week. And very often it is all compressed into four days. And then after that, I'm sucking my thumb in the corner. And so I kind of know, um, I'm doing okay today. I better pack it in. Or, you know, some of my mental health quirks come with severe insomnia. And if I'm up for 22 hours or 36 or 48, my family's only around for like 18 of those. So other than that, I can live in a dark room and be sad, or I can at least get something done. So Mm -hmm. I, I try and get stuff done as much as I'm able. And then there's days where my wife's like, you are miserable go watch a movie because you kind of suck today, you know, and I'll go watch a movie on that day. (laughs) 
listen to the experts. Yeah, well, and that's part of it too, is a lot of people mistake, you know, as far as productivity as a writer, a lot of people mistake writing for typing. They they conflate them completely. And typing, putting words on a screen or on a page, that's just a small part of writing. So if I am having a bad day, I can go see a movie and I can sort of take notes and go, oh, what would I do better? What would I do different? And then when I come back, I've got new ideas, not necessarily the ones from the movie, but you know, I've been able to recharge my battery even on a down day so that when I start writing, I'm, I'm kind of full of inspiration again. So um, there are days where, like I said, I'm, I'm literally like in my closet, just in the corner and my wife's job is to keep me from hurting myself. Um, and then there's a lot more days that are just really bad and tough. And on those days, I can still be writing, even though I'm not necessarily typing something. So I, I kind of think part of the secret is just to be learn to be effective with the time you have, whatever it is. Um, and I learned that when I was a lawyer, because I still was writing then and I'd wake up very early and I'd go to work and I'd come home and play with my family. And then I'd start to write at 10 o'clock and I'd work till one or two and then get up at five the next morning and do the whole thing again. Mm. See, I find that really interesting because I I went full time as a writer um, in April of this year. So kudos, I'm, thank you very much. I'm uh, I'm much happier for it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't realize how how much weight you're wearing of an old job until people physically tell you you look happier several weeks after leaving. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I have struggled isn't the right word, but one of the things I'm still getting used to is that. Uh, I do constantly feel like I'm switched on because yeah. it doesn't matter. I'll have my writing hours in the morning. I'll get those done. I'll sort of write until about midday or so. Um, I've got other things. I've got my marketing. I've obviously got this podcast that I work on, and I've got quite a lot of balls in the air with some of the projects I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And when people now ask me what my hobbies are, it's difficult to say because <laughs> it's my, my hobby is my job, which is my hobby. So yeah. there's, there's a part of me that on some level feels guilty for not giving myself other things to do but at the same time i'm so enveloped in this world that is writing that yeah i don't feel guilty for enjoying and loving the thing that i do yeah no and, and that's great i mean i think as far as you know having all these balls in the air and and how you do things and and uh, your earlier questions about do i read and things like that i i think it's really important to have a life i think it's really important that you get out and not be a writer uh, at least some of the time. And most people who are, especially if you're starting, it's a, it's a, it's a startup business and it takes a lot of time, but at the same time, like we were talking, you're a dad and I'm a dad and just being a part of a family gives you an outside source of, of inspiration and information. Um, mm. and I'm a, I'm a, very religious guy. So I have a church group. I'm actually the Sunday school president, which, which people really give me kind of side eye at given that I'm also this horror writer. <laughs> um, but you need to have those outside interests. And a lot of people, I think they're like, well, but I'm not interested in other stuff. And I go, yeah, but you're telling me that. So obviously you get out and you have friends and things like that. And you don't have to be like, you know, a world traveling playboy billionaire Batman type. You just have to be out <laughs> living your universe and being in the real world. Mm. there's definitely something rewarding about um being around a lot more for my son because i was working sort of your, your eight or half five six o'clock job uh -huh. and actually being able to take him to school in the mornings and pick him up and although i say that i do i have story on my mind a lot and a lot of um the time i am thinking about these projects i do have those <laughs> sort of windows in the morning where uh i would just sort of be in the zone with him getting him ready for school and then afterwards sort of playing with him until bedtime so yeah there is that I, it's, I guess it's just some of the territory that comes with being a father yeah and that's a and that's a great thing and and mm. and i'm not saying like you have to be a dad or a mom or you know part of that kind of family unit to be a writer um i find it rewarding and enriching but but just being out and being about and, and making sure that you're part of the world because i think the biggest job of any writer is to be a creator of community and um you know if you look at people who are you define as your tribe or your country or whatever it's because you have all agreed that the same stories are important and so if that's the job of a writer is to create these units these cohesive units of community it's very hard to do that if you've chosen to eschew them completely and, and be divorced and apart absolutely uh, one thing that i 
did want to come to, which I I saw again while coming uh, across some bits on your website, and it's something you mentioned earlier, is that you do like to inject humour into things. You sound like quite a humorous guy. Your TED talk <laughs> got a lot of laughs. Um, and under your your services that you provide, I just wanted to read this out and, and get your comments on, um, I guess, the origin of this service, where it uh-huh. came from, and <laughs> whether or not anyone has taken you up. And I, I feel like you might have some inkling of what I'm going to say. Uh-huh. <laughs> Okay, so one of your services is, quote, I will murder a loved one for shame. I was mostly seeing if you were paying attention here, but because I can be bought, price a bajillion dollars and six cents for taxes. Contact me indirectly via Vinny. Yeah. Um, Where did that come from? <laughs> that came from me being bored programming this this dumb website. I mean, like, <laughs> I put it all together myself. because I And part of, part of why I do all this is I just am a little bit um, – uh, it, not ADD because I can focus down, but I, do, I it's hard for me to stay interested in the same thing all the time. So when I'm you know bored being a writer, I can be a cover designer because I do all my covers. And when I'm bored with that, I can update my website. And I'm I get to go to the gym every day is the good thing because I'm constantly like taking online classes and I can do that while I'm you know on the treadmill or lifting weights. Um, so that's a, that's a nice thing. I'm one of the less sedentary writers out there because I do all this stuff. And so I was putting together my website and I'm writing down, you know, I'll critique your work and these, you know, different prices. And I just, I, it was just a drag. And so I just kind of stuck this thing and I had a, um, a buddy in high school who had this Romanian name, uh, Ilya, a great guy. And everyone had trouble with his name. So at one point I, or he, I can't remember. We're just like, ah, we're going to call him Vinny from now on. And he was this not at all threatening, very nice, cool guy. But when you called him Vinny, he got this kind of lurky, lurky look and this hooded look on his eyes, like he might break something. And, um, and so that was just kind of an homage to Vinny. And, and, um, and I made sure to call it a bajillion dollars <laughs> because I didn't want anybody ever being like either going, what's wrong with this guy, you know, cause he might be serious or even worse having someone go. So, um, uh, my wife is a problem. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just destroy any possibility that someone might take you up on that service. Right. Yeah. If they're like, and I've got the bajillion dollars, you know, that's someone I can probably <laughs> safely discount as a, as a threat to the, to the person they're not happy with. Fantastic. I love it. I think, I think it's a really creative way to, uh, to just keep that humor going. Is that something that you, uh, use a lot when you engage with writers. Yeah, uh, not write, writers. So with them, with your readers. Yeah, I do all the time. And I actually gave a talk, uh, or I give a talk periodically at like comic cons and things. And it's called humor and horror, one side of the same coin, because they are so closely related. I mean, they're both about yanking the rug out from under you, and they're both about pain. Um, I, and if you doubt that, watch your average comedy and think like, if I was standing right there with this person, would I be laughing or would I be running for the hospital, you know? Um, and so they're really, they're dynamically intertwined. And if you can make somebody laugh and then stab them, it's a lot more effective than just stabbing them. I mean, having it happen in a party where everybody's giggling is a lot more horrifying than, you know, oh, this, you know, oversexed teenager walked into the shed full of rusty tools. Let's be honest, they deserve it. Definitely. I uh, so I have one more main question for you before we get onto the the next segment, um, which is mm-hmm. the Patreon questions. But my my question for you, which is one that I like to ask most of my guests, is why do you write? <laughs> uh, like I said, it's because I you know I've sucked at not writing. I heard a great definition once of you know you're a writer if uh, the only thing worse than writing is not writing. Yes, and and that's <laughs> kind of the way it is. I mean, it when when I talk to people, a lot of them will say, I really want to be a full-time writer. And one of the things I'll ask is, do you have a job you enjoy and do you enjoy writing on the side? Don't mess with that, man. You've got dental and health coverage and you're already happy. You know, like writers have approximately the dental and health coverage in non-socialized medicine areas of like a crack whore. You know, like we don't... (laughs) We don't have all these things flowing to us and that creates stress. And then when you take your hobby and you turn it into your job, it becomes, spoiler, a job, Mm. you know? So I don't get to write when I feel like writing all the time. I sit down and write whenever I am physically and mentally capable because it's my job. Mm. So, you know, as far as why I got into writing, 
look, I am not beautiful. I'm not a sexy dude. I'm just kind of a guy. I, no one's ever like vomited when I walked in the room, but I kind of <laughs> had to develop a personality, you know, <laughs> um, because I didn't have the halo effect working for me. So I always like to tell stories and I grew up in a storytelling house and it just became part of my emotional and my mental uh, DNA. And so good luck getting me to not tell a story. And, and since that's the case and I suck at everything else, I might as well try and make money off of it. (laughs) I love it. I absolutely love that. Uh, okay. Fantastic. So jumping now into our Patreon segment. So I've got some questions from our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Um, feel free to take these in any way that you want to. Um, and I'll just read them straight as they were. So from Harley Christensen, she says, what tips do you have for moving beyond the mustache twirling cookie cutter villains to create captivating, compelling and relatable <laughs> baddies that readers hate to love, but do so anyway? What are some of your oh favorite examples of villains done well? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that you have to do if you really want to move away from the cookie cutter is you have to fall in love with your villain. Um, I tell people that they're, they're, you know, you look at people and the people you villainize, you go, they're insane they're evil but the reality is there's very few people in the world who are truly insane what most people have is a set of of experiences that warped them in a fashion diametrically opposed to the way you were warped by your experiences so if you can get into the head of the person that's the bad guy and i'm talking about in real life too um you can usually appreciate them on some level, you can at least sympathize with their plight and you can understand them to the point you can explain them. Every villain is their own hero. And if you can communicate that to your audience, I think you're halfway there. Um, as far as villains that really work, I wrote one that I really liked. Um, there's a book I have called This Darkness Light. And it's about a guy who wakes up in a hospital bed and he does not know anything about himself. He's got rapid or radical amnesia. Um, And he only finds out very quickly that everybody wants him dead. And so he has to kind of go on the run and figure out who he is. One of the people that he's chased by is a psychopath named Melville, who uh, sings Disney songs as he does (laughs) his most violent, despicable things. And I just, I love that, you know, it's those little kind of real moments. Cause we all know that person who sings, you know, has sung, let it go to us. And you're like, <laughs> I, I want to blow my own brains out right now. And, but they're real people and they're usually your friends. So you kind of tolerate it or you're singing it to your kids and then you have to tolerate it. So I thought, what if, you know, if it's a madman who's singing that while he's skinning someone. Mm. Um, and, and that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, Ian J. Middleton asks, what was the most challenging genre to write in and what piece of work are you most proud of? (laughs) Most challenging uh, is whichever one I'm working in right then. And which one I'm most proud of (laughs) is whichever one I've most recently finished, which which sounds really kind of glib and silly, but it's absolutely true because every single thing that I write, I'm trying to do something different than I've done before, which means there's so many chances for failure and there's a point in the middle of every book where I'm like, this is the one, this is the one where people realize I have been conning them for the whole time. (laughs) And, and I suck, you know? So once I get through that and I put it away, I'm like, that was the best thing I've ever written. And I'll read it 10 years from now. And I think reading your old stuff is sort of like looking at your high school yearbook picture. You kind of go, yeah, it was me, but, but I'm better now. I look different. You know, um, <laughs> I didn't, I don't have the zits and the background isn't like this laser splash thing that I don't understand. <laughs> um, so you have to kind of look at it and admit, admit, admit that it's you and then move on and be better. And, and so every book I finish, that's the best thing I've written to that point. John Cronshaw asks, and this is, I think, partly covered in some of the bits we spoke about earlier, but I think a bit more specifically, maybe on the marketing side of this, how do you brand or market yourself to so many disparate groups of readers? Oh, geez. It's a process of accretion, um, by which I mean, you know, you look at the Great Barrier Reef, which is this enormous thing that at its core is made up of billions of these little tiny unicellular or multicellular creatures and polyps and very tiny animals and bacteria that have grown into this giant thing. So part of it is I didn't start out as an everything writer. I started out as a guy who wrote these certain kinds of thrilling, scary twist books, and I was able to branch out over time. Um, Part of the branding is also I just 90% of my books have the same typeface for my name 
because that way people look at it and go, oh, that's Michael Brent Collings. I can see it really easily, even at a quarter inch thumbnail. Um, like I said, I do all my own covers. And aside from the romance, which has its own branding because of the bifurcation we talked about earlier, um, almost all my covers tend to be high contrast, real extreme darks, real extreme um, that really make shadows and, and make kind of a sense of threat no matter what the genre is. And, and so you can look at a cover and say, that's Michael Brent. And hopefully you read it, uh, you read a horror novel and then you go, well, this is fantasy, but he didn't suck at the horror. So I'll try this and maybe find out that I like him when he writes this as well. Mm. Fantastic answer. So now we will jump into the quick fire round. Thank you very much for uh, sending those questions in guys. Um, and the quick fire round is basically me throwing 10 questions at you as quickly as possible. And you giving me an answer as quickly as you can nice sweet are you happy just to dive straight in <laughs> heck yeah oh i thought we already started that's why i just said nice <laughs> um, <laughs> okay let's shoot uh what is your favorite genre to write in oh whichever one i'm writing i like them all what's your favorite book of all time my favorite book of all time probably the bible and and religion aside i think every writer should read it just because it is one of the most uh uh, it's, it's the single most popular book ever written in English and it's incredibly uh, influential on, on all writing. What's the greatest present you've ever received? Uh, my wife. Sweet or savory? <laughs> uh, crap. I don't know. Both of those. <laughs> I thought crap was your answer then. Oh crap. yeah. He's really <laughs> messed up. <laughs> Favorite theme park? Disneyland. Favorite time of day? Oh uh, also crap whichever one i'm feeling good at it varies day by day shooting stars or dazzling sunrises oh shooting stars those are bitching chicken beef or corn uh <laughs> mostly i eat chicken but i do like steak better when it's done right how tall are you i am five foot nine or five foot eight and a half depending on how slouchy <laughs> i am that day what's one thing from your bucket list that you're yet to do Oh, uh, you know, I kind of want to go um, parachuting one day just because heights terrify me. So I think it's important to get out and do things that scare you. Mm. Absolutely. And one bonus, bonus question is where can our listeners find out more about yourself and everything you're doing? So my website is writteninsomnia.com, uh, written insomnia stories that keep you up all night. You can find me by, honestly, my first name is Michael Brent. It's all one word and I'm the only one in the world. So if you <laughs> Google that, you're going to get all my top results. Um, there is a guy named Michael Space Brent who's like an underwear model. So that's not me. <laughs> and if you see me at a comic con, I don't want you being like, you're not sexy and you're fully clothed. What a double disappointment. <laughs> You'd hope that people weren't just going around Comic Cons looking for a naked man. Oh, you'd be surprised, man. There's some people <laughs> there you're like. Um, but thank you so much uh, for joining us, Michael Brent. It's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you and having you on the show. And uh, we'll wrap it up there and, and let you get on with the rest of your day. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by hybrid author of thriller, romance, nonfiction, and memoir, Rachel Heron, discussing Patreon, mindset, passion, and craft. And don't forget that you can get access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare. Until next time.